Welcome to Time to Heal. My name is Pam Hemphill and I'll be your host. Uh, today we're going to be talking about creativity and recovery. You know, there's a lot of social stigma out there about alcoholism and drug addiction. And unfortunately, you know, it's still a part of a shame-based cultural belief system. Why are we hiding our problem, uh, you know, being a judge, a doctor, a senator, a dentist, a police officer, school teacher, etc. You know, why do we hide the fact, an artist, that we have a problem with alcohol and drugs? You know, if you had a, you know, it's really silly. If you had a friend that was an alcoholic or an addict, you know, uh, you would do everything you could to get them help. But what if they were a diabetic? Would you look strange at them and say, what's wrong with you, you know? Or would you be shocked and would you like them any less just because they, they're they diabetic? Well, it's the same with our illness. It's an illness. It's a mind disease. Uh, we're trying to do everything we can to get rid of the stigma that holds a lot of us back by opening up and talking about it. And so on today's show, that's what we're going to be doing. I've invited Rachel here. She's an artist. She's in recovery and she's going to share parts of her story. You know, true recovery is full of courage, hard work, and miracles. There is no shame in it. Um, there are a lot of artists who do choose to remain anonymous, and a lot of them are not. Uh, on the website today, I was looking up artists in recovery, and I discovered that there are a lot of artists in recovery today. And it's a growing field, and there's some wonderful pictures there. So today, um, we're going to start off talking to Rachel and ask her some questions and have her share with us how she got started in, in this doing this type of work herself. But first, will you start off by sharing with us a little bit about your childhood, how you were raised? And um, well, I've moved around quite a bit. Um, I would say most of my upbringing came about when I was living in Phoenix, Arizona, because I spent most of my high school years over there. And so the high school that I went to, a lot of it was run by uh, uh, gangs from the prisons. There was a lot of violence, so I thought a lot of the drugs and weapons was normal. Apparently, I was um, wrong about that. I didn't really know any different. So I got really desensitized like from the get-go. and. <clears throat> I also grew up with, uh, I have like on my mom's side of the family, I would say that's where the, all the artistic type stuff comes from. And then with my dad's side of the family, that's where all of my like depression and substance abuse uh, issues come from. Um, <clears throat> and I've moved around quite a bit and now I'm in Idaho and I'm not leaving. <laughs> I love it here. So... <clears throat> And I also will mention that I am in long-term recovery from a lot of addictions. My primary substance of abuse is marijuana, and I'm talking street weed. So, and I will refer to marijuana as MJ, because when I found marijuana, I also got into um, uh, relationships with gentlemen, and I treat, treated both of them the same. And... I will say in all seriousness, like for myself to use marijuana, it's like an absolute death sentence for me to do it. And I know that I don't hear too many people that can actually say that. But for me, it, it caused quite a bit of havoc and some problems. Um, and then, and I know a lot of that stemmed from growing up with uh, depression and not knowing what that was. Because when I was younger, it was like before the pharmaceuticals came out, before we had names for a lot of things, so like my dad and myself didn't necessarily know what we were dealing with. Um, but he, my dad did talk to me quite a bit about what was happening, at least with his own self. And I would, I would get to watch it with him, like how depression affected my dad. Um, didn't quite understand what it was, but we knew something was like we had limitations um, in a lot of ways. Was your dad? Uh at different times smoking marijuana too? I don't know really how to describe that. He, uh, he's actually pretty responsible, I'd say, with his own mental health disabilities and substance, I guess, addiction. I think he, he might have dabbled around a little bit with marijuana and when he was like, and stopped when he was 18, but 
not much else went on other than that. I remember he had mentioned to me when I was younger that he briefly dabbled with like hallucinogens and when that happened it completely changed him like permanently in a, in a bad way so that stuck with me so what ended up happening is that I kind of already knew not to <clears throat> and I don't mess around with the stereotypical like the bigger drugs um, but I never heard anything about marijuana though I didn't hear anything about about that so I was very naive about it and so when I was introduced to it um, I had no idea what I was getting myself into and I would imagine I because when I first got into it I was immediately like addicted I went right into the chemical dependency I went out of my way and above and beyond to do it as much as possible um, you know no moderation as a lot of us in recovery we don't do a lot of things in moderation so yeah it just full force like when I got a hold of it and, and I didn't there wasn't any information out there back then that said anything bad about it and so I bought into all the myths like anybody else probably would. So what'd your father's depression look like? Was he <clears throat> staying home a lot? Was he suicidal? Was he drinking a lot? Uh, you mentioned suicide. It's important to note that for whatever reason with my upbringing my dad uh, there were some things that he had said to me, so suicide was like actually never an option when I was growing up. I just had, we had beliefs associated with it that that wasn't an option. And, but yet that doesn't mean that we're not necessarily okay. Like how do you uh, live when you're not living? <laughs> yeah. And so there, there was one time, like when I mentioned limitations, there was a time that I know like, if we have depression, um, not to work a night shift because sleep is a, of utmost importance with dealing with symptoms of depression. And there was a time when my dad ended up getting put on a graveyard shift. He was working out at like a power plant and uh, it almost killed him. Um, I think he was up for, I don't know, like two weeks. He couldn't sleep and it was, it was a little scary. But I wasn't quite all there either at the time, so I didn't really know what was going on. Like my dad, we, we probably, we cancel, like we didn't, we didn't get to do a lot of activities a lot of the times, but I understood, like he had limitations. I didn't take it personal as a kid. My mom was kind of like the mediator with us. Uh, she kind of had to deal with both of us in her own way. Um, you were suffering with depression too? Oh yeah. Um, and since, again, we didn't have, like, the verbiage or terminology associated with what was happening. Um, in fact, I had a recent conversation with my mom <clears throat> not long ago, and she was telling me that I had a talk with my dad, and I was talking to him about, um, I think she said, I, I said it, that I was hearing voices, not like um, schizophrenia-wise, but just, uh, you know, like something's not right, mm -hmm. like another part of me. and. My dad had to talk with me and told me what to do and how to manage it and not to feed into it. However, I didn't listen to him. <laughs> I just, I, I fed into it quite a bit. Um, I would describe, like depression is a whole nother monster in a way, in, a, in addition to um, addiction, like abusing substances. I like to describe depression as something like a, like having a third arm like literally it's very uh, awkward it gets in the way sometimes <laughs> yeah. and I don't think anybody in their right mind is really gonna want to like try to cut that off because it'd probably be painful and it, it's it, you know it's awkward um, and I think there comes a time in life and even for my own self just in this last year through a series of uh, road trips and some journeys I went on, um, I would say that I actually metaphorically severed that third arm, and then and then I kind of had a phantom arm effect for a little while, and that was awkward. Um, and then now, I feel like it's not there anymore at all. Like I actually I feel really good right now. Like very I'm very balanced. I'm very present. 
Um, but I've been practicing and doing a lot of, I don't know, soul searching, grounding techniques. I mean, all kinds of things. So, how did marijuana help you deal with your depression? Did it take away the symptoms? Um, deal with it well. It made me feel just a little bit better. Um, I mean, obviously, with depression, I didn't feel like the average normal. I was just a little below that, so the marijuana was kind of like a fake. Um, like, oh, this is a little better, so I, I latched onto that, like as much as I could. <laughs> it's pretty common for a lot of addicts and alcoholics. We're we're medicating the symptoms. <clears throat> oh yeah. Of what's really going on? Yeah, I mean that's a good way to describe it. It is a way. It was a way of self-medicating because I didn't know what else. You know. So. A lot of people think they think depression, they think the person's laying in the bed with the covers over their head, they can't come out. That's not necessarily true. Sounds like what you're mm -hmm. describing. Uh, so maybe elaborate just a little bit more on the type of depression you're just talking about. Um, I don't know the terminology, because um, there is different types of depression, whether it's situational, traumatic events, accumulation of... Um, <clears throat> toxins in the body. Mine was like, I'd say I was born with it, like lacking chemicals in the brain. Mm -hmm. So serotonin. <laughs> so it was kind of a from the get go. So I think as a as a teenager, it was just it was just different. Everything was a little darker. It, it, depression was just very subtle. I think. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily get the extreme symptoms. It was more of feeling irritable for no for no <laughs> reason <laughs> and no source of the problem. Although I do kind of have a twofold on that. I'm also affected by the weather. I guess mm -hmm. we what we call it yes. seasonal affective disorder. Right. So I have limitations on where I would or would not choose to live. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm not gonna go kick it in Alaska or Portland, even though I would love to. I've heard lighting <laughs> helps a lot with that, and uh, vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Have you it's tried any of the, the lighting or vitamin D? Yeah, it's kind of like so vitamin D with the hormones and then the, with the lighting. Yeah, like to me, sunshine is a straight up drug. Like when the winter hits and we have this inversion settling in, I could just be crying, eyes watering for no reason. And then I will do everything in my power to go up to, to drive out of that and pop up into the, like I'll usually pop out of the clouds and then it's la, like sunshine. I stop, everything stops and then I just, I feel instantly better. So there's ways to manage that. Um, I will make a note though in regards to depression. I think it was maybe three, four years ago I came across some information. Um, for the yeah. record, I don't like reading, but I did read a book. <laughs> yeah. The Depression Cure. Mm -hmm. This was a game changer. The information in this book um, and what it suggests to do to treat like insomnia, depression was, it worked so well that it kind of freaked me out. Can you share what some of those tools were? It talks a little bit about like a supplement a person can take. Vitamin? Um, yeah, a vitamin. Because I, and I hadn't mentioned back in the day when I was in school and messing around with street weed and then I ended up getting some stuff that's laced. And then I ended up, my mental health just completely catapulted. Like it sped up fast forward. Okay. Um, and then my dad too was having a hard time and back in high school when they first came out with uh, some of the medications for um, depression, one of them like the Welby Trends saved my dad mm -hmm. and then I ended up getting on it and so I had maybe like a nine month period where mm -hmm. that saved my butt. It really like saved my life at the time. Um, is this before recovery or after recovery? During. During recovery. I suppose, yeah. Yeah, yeah now we have some very safe yeah. medications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Addicts don't want them. If you had it sitting yeah. here, they wouldn't even of start. Of course. Zoloft, Bruce yeah. Bar. 
And that's, I think, part of the symptoms of having a mental health disability is that we're like, ah, oh, rah, 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 I don't want to do this. And it's, I know. That's a Denial big... of the disease. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's, the next time around, I ended up, it was actually um, after I had decided to stop uh, my marijuana use altogether. I fought it for a while. I didn't want to have to go on well be trained again and I, I probably stuck it out for about a year after my sobriety and uh and then I ended up I went on a well be trained again and it it was like it's like sucked me out of a hole and I'm like oh this is what it feels like to have the cobwebs removed <laughs> and to see things a little clearer so it helped for the time being while I kind of got stuff in order and because I was just white knuckling it and barely hanging on um and so like with the use, I mean, things, things got pretty rough. Um, so when I, up like the year up before I stopped and decided to stop and break it off with MJ, <laughs> I probably went through about like 12, 13 different jobs. I couldn't keep a job to save my life. Uh, my mental health was completely shot. My immune system had completely like shut down, so the physical health started to deteriorate with all the long-term effects, um, and you know, d really dysfunctional relationships that I was in, and this is dear recovery. Towards the end, when I decided to stop, what brought you into the program? Was it the depression, or was it the use of marijuana? What brought you into the 12-step program? You know, like some oh, people you mean lose. into recovery? Yeah, into did, what brought you into recovery? To choose sobriety. Um, uh, how did you hit a bottom? What, what happened? It's just, it was just too painful. It was too much. I just knew that whatever I was doing, it wasn't working anymore, and I, I needed to change it up. Okay. Um, so, and then I decided <laughs> to stop. Um, did you go into treatment, or did you just go to a 12-step program? Back then, um, ironically, uh, I... I had never heard of 12-step meetings. I didn't know anything about that back when I decided to stop. Um, I tried to get in a treatment, and I remember there was one company I tried to go to, and I was rudely denied, and I didn't have insurance, and I had, I had no idea what to do. Um, and <clears throat> maybe I forgot to mention earlier, like nowadays, I'm actually, I work as a drug and alcohol counselor. Yeah. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in psychology and in visual arts. Um, yeah, don't forget, discuss mm -hmm. your artwork here. Definitely. How did this get started? <clears throat> well, I've always been fascinated with psychology and the arts, and I've always wanted to kind of like get to know myself better. And I, I've always kind of had a pool to work with people that suffer from mental health uh, addiction. So in my early recovery, when I decided to stop my use, um, I really ended up learning about addiction and withdrawals and triggers and all the terminology by going into the profession of helping other people. Yeah. And then that in turn ended up helping me so I can understand what the heck was happening with me. Yeah. <laughs> and then with that too, I ended up doing a lot of uh, artwork. Um, most of my artwork ended up coming about in sobriety time. So I was much more creative while sober. You want to share about um, those two pictures there? I brought a couple. These two are my favorite <coughs> portraits. I have a... This one is my husband. <laughs> and he's a huge, huge support for me. And then this one here is my a friend of mine that's in recovery that I met in, in the earlier time of my recovery. Uh, so this is my husband, Tim, and this is a friend of mine named Jason. And this is his son, Sebastian. Um, these two people were a very huge influence and impact for me. Jason especially because uh, I met him in early recovery and we're both kind of like adrenaline junkies. We both do quite a bit of stuff. Um, it is important to mention in my early recovery, thank God for snowboarding <laughs> because it absolutely saved my life. Um, I literally replaced one addiction for the other. I 
At least a I've positive always, one. Yeah. And, I, and I've always been in the boarding. I do longboarding, skateboarding, snowboarding. And so when I met this friend of mine, and um, he does a lot of like BMX biking and high risk mm -hmm. sports, and in spite of his injuries and accidents and struggling with um, his addiction, and I just, I love that. It was like, great. It's my age. <laughs> We're still going at it. Um, it's healthier avenue. <laughs> Don't you two have a yoga class or something you're, you're doing with that 12-step yoga <clears throat> class? Mm -hmm. Well, if we're talking about uh, a lot of the different healing modalities for uh, mind, body, spirit, I'm a big uh, like holistic pusher. Uh, I do a lot of somatic therapy, which is body and cognitive therapy because I don't think the cognitive is enough um, so I participate in and I host a group that's called yoga 12 step or actually y12 SR um, and I I'm hosting one of the ones in Idaho um, I you know if we talk about like a lot of the stuff that helps keeps us grounded or that's worked really well for me and it's just unraveled all the issues in the tissues like literally metaphorically the yoga 12 step the mindfulness the breath work um, getting grounded to just be anything we do to just be present is powerful um, so I, I highly recommend a lot of the different grounding techniques there's also like EFT tapping into it is an extremely powerful one Mm -hmm. EMDR, um, hypnosis, uh, flotation tank. Um, so you're mentioning these as a way to help with the symptoms. It's mm -hmm. not the cure, but right. the symptoms. It helps us literally, like, it's mm -hmm. helped me to let go. Like, And I, I suppose it would be similar for folks that actually work through a 12-step program and mm -hmm. they have those aha moments. I mean, there's a lot of ways to get to those moments. Yeah, and I've heard those therapies help very, uh, a lot for those that have panic attacks too. Mm -hmm. You have panic attacks with your depression? Mm -hmm. I, back in the day I used to when the with the depression, but the grounding techniques work like a charm for that. Do you think there was any serious trauma way, way back as a child <clears throat> for you? Or just having um, to deal with the father's depression? I'll use? refer back to uh, a friend of mine that's in the, one of these portraits. One of the things that we both have in common, aside from being in a recovery, um, and we're both an only child, uh, both of us also have a son. Um, his son turns two in December. My son will be turning 18 on December 1st, and I have not seen him since he was born. Um, because, and I would imagine, so I'm a, I'm a birth mother and then I relinquished my rights and decided to have an adoptive family raise my son. Um, I don't know where he's at or, but I know he's doing okay. It's kind of like a partial open adoption. So I get pictures every once in a while. Um, but yeah, this last year, and maybe it's because he's turning 18 soon, I don't know, uh, my my heart is just absolutely open and just bleeding with like love and compassion and um, there's just been all these signs and omens and all these things that have like happened in this last year that is just like tripping me out and a lot of it uh, has a lot to do with my son and I really s suspect that we'll probably end up um, reuniting somehow. I don't know. That would be no wonderful. Idea. Yeah. And I will mention, I, w I was not that long ago when I chose to walk the work to pace myself, practice some patience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Instead of riding a bike or driving, I, as I was walking, in fact, if I have it with me, I came across this coin. <clears throat> and there's this, this speed up coin. It has a cross on it mm -hmm. and I'm not somebody that has a lot of uh, religious type stuff in the house um, 
or, or whatnot, but I came across this and for some reason it just made me think of my son. And That's awesome. I, it's just weird, weird stuff's been happening. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, so with my friend and I, we both, I know we have these journeys ahead of us where we're going to be working on relationships, uh, rebuilding with, I guess, a lost loved one or because my friend's not allowed to see his son and I haven't seen mine, but so many things can happen. I don't even know. Absolutely. And you know, I found in recovery, it's like an onion. More gets peeled off and more happens. And, mm -hmm. But today, you know, you've got your artwork, you've got your friends and mm -hmm. it's exciting to know what you're doing and how your recovery's coming and it's just, I'm mm -hmm. excited for you. Yeah. You're a blessing, you know. exciting. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're coming to an end now. Is anything last real quick that you'd like to say? We only got a couple of minutes. Only a couple of minutes. To the audience. A um, couple of minutes. I, you know, I write a lot of letters to folks that are ex-clients and stuff that end up incarcerated, and I, I love writing letters. I get a lot of folks talking about <clears throat> being ashamed and apologizing and why did I do this again? Why am I in this? And... And I keep thinking like, man, you know, we really make things so com overcomplicated sometimes. And <clears throat> since we're human beings, it's like, I think the trick is, it's like how to just be. And I think for folks, if you wanna be ashamed, okay. If you wanna be numbed or maybe miss a moment and don't wanna be in it, that's fine too. Or maybe you wanna be a little curious, a little happy, a little uncomfortable, that's, that's cool. Go for it. It's all good. <laughs> I hate it. I love it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> and my brother's an artist, too, and uh, it's a great way to tell the story, too, what happened. Yeah. And that color orange tells me something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And if you're an artist, you know what the color orange stands for. I wanted to mention quickly, I want to thank uh, my those of you who have been viewing today for watching our show, and I want to thank my friends on Facebook for watching my show today, and for my little friend out there that just recently contacted me and said she relapsed, just know that the people in the program love you and are thinking about you, and you're not alone, and don't give up, okay? There's a website for sober artists, you just look them up, it's called Creativity and Recovery. And one book that I have read that it's helped me tremendously, and it's not just about art, it's about finding the creative person within you. Everyone has one. You may be an artist, uh, you may find out later, later that you can really be great as an editor, which I have a friend here that is doing our shows for us. Uh, you could be a chef cooking. There's so much creativity out there, and this book would help you a lot. It's called The Artist Way. And I don't care who you are and how far down the scale you've gone, how many times you've been in the program, don't give up. Stay with this one more day, okay? I've been clean and sober for 35 years. It does get better. And all I can share again and tell you is this is a great example right here and what she's doing in her recovery and you're not alone. So don't give up. Your miracle's on its way. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> give me a hug. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to have had this year a lot more. It went too fast. That went too fast.